let's be creative here. Let's be called Amazon USA, or let's let's be let's be called Honda Canada. You know, whatever it takes, uh, and create even more icons and bigger stars in, in the game of sevens that people and young young men and young women will aspire to be. Then, you know, we've got that opportunity, um, but we we need to seize the day. He's so dangerous. Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dallin Stanford, and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens international. Back in my playing days, I went head-to-head against Dallin in the USA. For several years, Robin has coached international Sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDowell rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Oh, it's more dangerous than climate change. Welcome to episode six. This is our first head-to-head featuring Mike Friday and Henry Paul. What a treat to have two sensations on at one time. Mike uh, coaching the U.S. Eagles for the last seven years or so. That's how I've known him. Took over from Matt Hawkins. And commentating, of course, the U.S. Eagles playing as well. has been always entertaining when Mike comes in halftime and drops a few F-bombs. You've got to apologize to the millions watching around the world. Uh, he certainly keeps us guessing. And then Henry Paul, I only actually met Henry. I knew of his legendary status as a player in the league and rugby union uh, circles. But I met him through Carl Tanana, the great Zulu warrior at the Dubai Sevens. Um, and just wonderful to see just such brilliant characters involved, you know. Um, and I believe, Robin, you've been stepped by, uh, by the great man yourself. Stepped, run over, offended. Yeah, I, I, I first met uh, HP on the World Seven Series, him playing for England. I was on the receiving end, uh, I think, when he was on loan from the 15s in in. George in, in your part of the world, Southern South Africa. And then, uh, and then most recently, obviously working together with him a bit in the, in the Canadian men's setup. And from there, uh, Mike Friday originally met him on the, on the world seven series. He was coaching England back in, back in my early days. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, just, just a big fan of him as a coach, somebody I definitely look up to having worked with so many different countries and, uh, building programs and just being successful. So it's really special to, to have them both featured on here as, as they're really close as well. Uh, what'd you get up to this last, this last week and what do you got on the, on the go this week? Just a lot of beach, my friend, just getting outside and it's so hot here in the, in the summer in Westport, Massachusetts, lots of, um, uh, beach, beach rides as well on the bikes, uh, some sunset jars. I'm definitely keeping the drinks well away from Verity so she can't steal them. So, uh, less social media for her, but at least more golden nectar for me. Uh, and then this coming week, my friend, uh, still doing some work on the rugby town sevens rewind, got a chance to speak to the mullet man this past week. It was a real highlight. Um, his hair though, I will say is, is a bit of a letdown, my friend. He's going to have to uh, get back to work on that mullet, uh, that made him famous at the rugby town sevens last, uh, last time and, and yourself, my friend, I believe you went away this weekend for what would have been your actual wedding, right? Yeah, we had some family in town, so uh, we made we made uh, lemonade out of lemons as always. Uh, the wedding will be postponed for a year here, but uh, yeah, enjoyed uh, Southern Vancouver Island. Went to the West Coast. So busy uh, with COVID, Canadians not being able to travel outside the country. So it, it looked like downtown Las Vegas in beautiful Tofino, Tofino Uculet, and uh, and bumped into the legendary Canadian Jeb Sinclair, one of Havana's old uh, teammates there. So he's he bought a golden retriever. Him and his partner bought a golden retriever at the same time as as my fiance and I did. So uh, you know, as retired rugby players, we set up a puppy date on the Long Beach in Tofino and let our dogs run wild. But uh, it was good to see the big man and uh, and to meet his pop. And uh, yeah, the back back to work this week and and dialed right in. So looking forward to uh, doing a bit of planning with rugby and uh, getting caught up on the hive this week. Beautiful. And any shout outs or thank yous you got for us? Yeah, just a good friend, Brett Cannenberg. Uh, he's doing a lot of work in behind the scenes to fire up MacDill Rugby. We're, we're hoping to kickstart again this fall with a return to play plan. So there's a lot of paperwork to do uh, to make sure all the athletes and staff are, are safe, of course. Um, but uh, he did he did me a great favor. He um, he framed my my one of my Mexican World Cup jerseys that the girls gave me. 
and uh, he's he's got a side business called Canwood Timberworks, and he does that on the side outside of being a school teacher and just a huge community guy. So shout out to Brett Cannonberg and Canwood Timberworks. How about you? Well, firstly, I need to get some jerseys framed. So I don't know if he's an international star yet. So we'll have to get him involved with that, you know. But uh, yeah, I just was very impressed with our last uh, uh, response to episode five. Uh, Fijian fans of Osio Kalinasau. And it was just just great to see everybody, you know, hitting the play button. And then then seeing Ben Ryan this past week post that, you know, it has been four years to the day that uh, uh, his side lifted that gold medal at the 2016 Olympic Games. So that was really special and it's cool to see how, you know, we, we, we timing, timing wise, we featured him and then all of a sudden it, it happened as well. But a couple of little shout outs from my side, Tiger Rugby, uh, founded by the great Paul Holmes and James Walker, two good personal friends of mine from the Republic uh, that are doing wonderful work here in North America. TigerRugby.com, you can check them out online. They've got some camps coming up because there's not much rugby going on here in the US currently. So it's good to see them still keeping things going. And then another rugby friend of mine, and this one uh, with Paulus Verdes Rugby in Southern California, um, Jeremy Wilkinson, he's founded Focus Care Products, um, which is a rugby-owned company that focuses on CBD oils, um, tinctures, a couple of great things, uh, and they're called focuscareproducts.com. So he sent me a bunch of samples, so I'm keen to test them out and, uh, and see how they go. And Make uh, sure, uh, make sure yeah. you send a shipment to, to the mullet man. Yeah, the mother man, exactly. He'll need some of that. Uh, of course, rugby coffee, we need to get some products to you because I know you've been funneling 55 jars. So uh, we'll get that out pretty soon to you, my friend. Without further ado, here is episode number six. Today's guests are legends Mike Friday and Henry Paul. Mike Friday is one of the most successful sevens coaches of all time. He led England on the HSBC World Rugby Seven Series to third in 2005 and second in 2006, with Henry Paul being a standout member of that talented squad. Friday then took Kenya from 12th to 5th in the world, their best ever finish in Sevens history. And recently, he turned potential into podium finishes, with Team USA climbing the ladder from 13th in 2014 to Series Runners-Up in 2019. His side was the most consistent team on the planet in 2019, playing in all 10 semi-finals. Friday will take the USA Eagles for the second time to the Olympic Games. This time, it's Japan 2021. The former England Sevens captain is also a two-time winner of the Anglo Welsh Cup with London Wasps. Henry Paul has done what many dream of but can never accomplish, play both Rugby League and Rugby Union successfully. So much so that he represented New Zealand in Rugby League 24 times from 1995 to 2001, scoring 121 points and playing in two Rugby League World Cups. The following year, he debuted for England in Rugby Union, playing in six tests from 2002 to 2004 and later the Sevens World Series. He has played well over 500 professional club matches. In league, he has represented Wakefield Trinity, Wigan 147 times, scoring 550 points and winning the Super League Grand Final, Bradford Bulls 100 times, amassing a remarkable 960 points and winning the Super League Grand Final, and Harlequin 63 times, scoring 240 points. In Union, he's played for Bath, Gloucester, Leeds Carnegie and Rotherham. He has also won a silver medal in sevens at the 2006 Commonwealth Games and is the current Canadian sevens head coach preparing for the Olympic Games in Japan. In today's episode, we talk about the England sevens program being cut by the RFU in 2020 ahead of the 2021 Olympics. We also go down memory lane when Paul played for Friday on the sevens World Series, as well as how he was able to represent both New Zealand and England. We talk about both guests how they got started with coaching, their programs in USA and Canada as they prepare for the Olympic Games, and what it's like coaching against each other. What was touring like in the early years? Why is Friday named Giza? And why are Russians the friendliest people on earth? Here are legends Mike Friday, USA Sevens coach, and Henry Paul, Canadian Sevens coach. All right, gents, listen, thanks so much for joining us. It's uh, quite a change uh, that we've seen. The last time I think us four were at the same venue was Vancouver Sevens in March with 40,000 fans. And here we are all across the world. How, how are we doing there? HB, how, how's things going during this break? Yeah, I'm uh, coming quite a, quite a decent baker at the moment, uh, doing a bit of baking. Um, yeah, just trying to stay sane. Um, a lot of analysis. Uh, you know, the season seems to be wrapped up, so putting a lot of stuff together for individuals and the team, and um, yeah, trying to keep up to date on my COVID nineteen knowledge. Um, yeah, every day is a bit of a challenge. I'm wearing pants today for your 
for your uh, vlog for this video. Uh, that's nice to be able to put some pants on. <laughs> that's a real treat. So what's your favorite thing you've been baking? I have been trying, like, like I love uh, banana bread. So different, different forms of banana bread. So I'm trying to throw in some sweet potato in my banana bread, like <laughs> just as I can at the moment. Um, no, it's been, yeah, it's been really, really good trying different things. So. It, it, sounds dis- it sounds disastrous, actually, on this side with a sweet potato. Now, Mike, yourself, how are things going for you in England? Um, well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. We're, we're in a bit of a lockdown, and, um, you know, I struggle if I'm not allowed to do things, um, and I'm not allowed to get into people. So, fortunately for the Americans, they're the other side of the pond. But, um, I, fortunately enough, for the first time in about five years, I've been able to spend a lot of time with, with my two boys, so they literally are killing me every day um, doing exercise and in the gym, which is good for, for the waistline, but not good for the ego as my youngest is 13 and my eldest is 17. So that's a bit of a humbling experience. And then I look forward to the weekends. And uh, interestingly enough, we've got this, um, one of the previous clubs I played for, Wasps. We've got a, a WhatsApp group, which is the Wasps Legends, which is now up to 230 members. And uh, we have a bit of fun over the weekend um, kind of roll back, uh, let's say, our childish years and uh, I chuck a few kind of bar games um, through the weekend, which is great because you see videos of old faces that you haven't seen and uh, it just allows you to stay connected and, and remember a little bit of, of, uh, of, the, of the past as well. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult times, um, but you find a way, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Taking the positives out of it. Massive news in the rugby world. England's sevens program has been cut as of August 2020. The RFU is citing financial constraints in the current pandemic. England sevens, just to remind our listeners, were silver medalists at the 2018 Sevens Rugby World Cup. And Great Britain, which fielded eight English players, won silver at the 2016 Olympic Games. So, Mike, let's start with you, former England sevens player, obviously, and coach. Your opinion on the news that just came out? I mean, it's devastating news. It's gutting. Um, you know, I, I just, I was there at the start when we, we started the legacy. Um, and, you know, we picked up from where that great team in, in 93 had won the Rugby World Cup sevens and then England had fell away and we rebuilt the programme to create that development pathway that produced and helped so many England internationals go on to fulfil dreams in the 15s and the Premiership. Um, it has changed and mutated to the programme it is today, but nonetheless, I think it's uh, it's a big part of the English landscape here, especially in the school sector and the community game. And the likes of Dan Norton, Tom Mitchell, and, and all of and all of those guys are are role models and, and, and icons amongst the the, the younger generations of, uh, of rugby players who aspire to be them. So I'm hopeful that um, Sense is found and a solution and, and, and maybe, just maybe, this is um, a bit of a strategic play to ensure that maybe we can get Team GB to the table, which could be the natural evolution in any event in the sevens game in the UK. Yeah, we hope so. Our thoughts, obviously, with those 18 contracted players as well. HB, what's your take? As a, as a former player, yeah, look, also I'll support Mike. I, I, I was surprised when they um, they mentioned it. I know they've mentioned it in the past um, over the last couple of seasons. Um, the difficulties that the RFU are having uh, behind the scenes, and um, you know, it's the very little that read about it. But yeah, I, I, you know, I've got to support Mike. And that it is devastating. I, you know, I was part of that um, that legacy and part of that squad. Geez, back uh, 2001 to 2006, um, probably the best times in my rugby career would have been part of that, that squad. Um, you know, whether it was training um, at Penny Hill Park or, ch- or training wherever we were because um, we moved around a bit um, to going on, on the tours, you know, which was just amazing, you know, amazing times with some great players, some great guys um, through, you know, wins and losses. So, yeah, I feel for um, Tom, Mitch, and those guys, um, Dan. Um, but I think, you know, the, the environment, the landscape is, is difficult at the moment. Back to the, the World Series landscape with England out. Um, hard to say. Will, will it open doors for other teams and other nations and, and grow the game? Let's hope that, that um, if, if England can't reconcile and, and, and get something together uh, behind the scenes, 
um, then then it opens the door for other nations. So maybe that's uh, maybe there can be a positive in terms of the world game. But yeah, I, you know, it's important. My like when you go to some of these uh, school age tournaments that, that are mainly built around sevens and and maybe tens. Um, you know, kids do want to be Dan Norton. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's going to be a massive shame that that there's not those players to look up to, uh, that they can replicate, um, copy. Uh, we all we all want we all have role models. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a difficult difficult aspect. And in terms of world rugby, um, I don't know. Uh, Mike might have a Mike's on the committee, uh, coaches committee. He might have a bit more insight. I mean, yeah, for for, for me, I think I I actually think this is a real opportunity for the seven circuit. I think, you know. We have to change. It has to evolve. The whole seventh circuit has to evolve. And, you know, I, I've been quite vocal um, around private partnership or, or private investment investment to allow us to possibly franchise. And, of course, that comes with, with, a, with a cost. But I think the, the series has to evolve. It has to change. It, it also has to be recognised for what it is. It, 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 it's, it's a big part of the rugby global landscape. The 15s is, is, the, is the kingpin. But... Truly, truly, if the game is going to be global, then there has to be more than the usual suspects that can compete to win. And Sevens provides that opportunity in both the men's and the women's game for that to happen. So I, I believe that, you know, we have to secure the World Seven Series. We have to think um, differently. We have to, to recognise and realise that um, as Sevens programmes, maybe we have to partner and, and create a hybrid of the Formula One, the F1 model, as well as, you know, something that, that Team GB did with Team Sky in the cycling many years ago. And I think there's a lot to be said there because we can reposition the World Series. We can create the media, digital media broadcasting platform. Then we truly can take this game global, which is what it's all about. It's about spreading the spirit, the values, the essence of the game of rugby you know, and the, and the Olympics is the, is the pinnacle. And that's why I hope and I sense and, I, and I'm, I'm wanting Team GB and, and, the, and the teams, the home nations, Scotland, Wales and England to, to probably see sense and realise that Team GB could be the way forward and part of that evolution on the world circuit, which doesn't stop or not allow England, Scotland and Wales sevens teams to participate and and, and continue because those pathways and those programs can be operated at rugby Europe level, the rugby world cup sevens level and the Commonwealth games. So those pathways can feed into team GB, which will allow the, you know, the university system, the rugby system in the UK, which is evolving um, whereby the university system of all these players that aren't quite making at 18, 19, that are going into the almost like a, a kind of an American can Canadian scholastic system late developers, which our sport is renowned for, and then can be picked up again, rather than fall out of love with the game and, and not realise that there's more than one way to skin a cat, there's more than one way to get where you want to get to. I mean, Rory McConaughey is the, is the, is the latest example through the England Sevens, and then you've got you know, James, Jamie Davis with, uh, with Wales and, and how he went about things. And then you've seen what's happened you know, with, at Scotland with the likes of you know, young George Horn recently. So... I, it doesn't make sense right now, and I'm just hoping that they've they've taken this drastic decision to try and create an opportunity for change to happen. But um, it's it, it's just devastating for those players and the coaches and the management, all of those individuals that have given so much to England Sevens over the last some of them ten years um, to to be. I'm going I will be conjured to be treated in the way that they've been treated, and you know. We all understand the, the cost of running a program, but by the same token, if it underpins the essence of the community game, then surely you find a way to keep the dream alive and, um, and, and mitigate or manage some of those losses. So, yeah, it's, uh, heart, heart goes out to all of them. Um, but I, I hope some commercial business sense and some evolution can happen on the World Series because... We're in difficult times at the moment and we need to think differently, but we need to recognise that Sevens is very much a future of making sure that rugby stays global and stays relevant.
Yeah, my heart goes out to those those athletes for sure. And um, you know, I know in North America it's it's challenging, and obviously in the tier two nations it's even more challenging. And when it happens to one of the big fish, it it makes media and gets gets people's hairs up a bit, right? So, um, I, I guess um, HP, how has it affected uh, the Canadian Olympic men's sevens program and the women's? I guess, and uh, what's that landscape like? Well, like, as you know, Robin, it's a, you know it's an amateur sport here in, in, in Canada. Um, we do our best. Uh, uh, sevens players, uh, you know, we you know they're, they're probably some of the most talented f- footballers we've got in Canada. Uh, this squad's been together, experienced squad um, for a while now, and they've obviously all you know holding on for their dream. There's some some guys that have been uh, you know started their rugby well, a long time ago, probably played in. Uh, yeah, because a few of them played the 2015 World Cup uh, in the UK. So um, they've been around, uh, you know, they, they realise that, you know, that things can change quickly and this pandemic has really affected our program massively. Uh, we, we know we're probably not going to play um, and, and until probably the new year, um, obviously with um, Dubai and Cape Town being cancelled. So... Yeah, we're just trying to keep our, you know, keep everyone fresh and, and healthy. That's the that's the main goal. Um, the Olympic Committee obviously uh, do fantastic job in providing funds for the guys, athletic athletic assistance um, programs. So, you know, and then education is a big piece of it as well. So the guys, you know, uh, we're on a reduced reduced program, um, and every, everyone's kind of you know trying trying to get jobs and, and work part-time it's a part-time program um and i think it's good for the mind and mind and body you know being able to work as well as and then and potentially a career path could come out of this as well because yeah rugby sevens doesn't really have a career path for it um fantastic game you know, it's a lot of time and commitment from the players going to 10 tournaments a year it's pretty much six months so uh it's difficult it's it's challenging um but they love it you know we all we all love it coaches managers um uh, and when we get a bit of success against some of the, the top tier T1 nations, um, it feels even sweeter, you know? Yeah, HP, you, you're uh, spot on there. In fact, Robin and myself are used to those days when we had to work full time and, and then be available for a tour every now and again. You tell your boss you're gone for three weeks. They're like, you must be mad. Uh, Mike, let's ask you the, the last question on this topic, which is you've been very creative with the USA side to keep the program going over the years. Um, also, with the with Olympics coming up, I know that uh, the US is in a unique position. Other than other countries have you know ministers of sport and they help fund programs. So, how are you managing uh, things for the Americans? <laughs> um, I mean, it's been a topsy turvy five or six months. We're in bankruptcy or, or Chapter Eleven. Um, so, you know, we've managed to ring fence and 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 keep the the players. Uh, financially where they need to be and you know as, as Henry's just said in, in in USA we don't the boys don't make a lot of money but they, they love the game they love being a part of, of the process the staff have not been so fortunate in in terms of the last five or six months have been in, insanely hard you know we, without pay for for a, a, the majority of them and and just myself for the last four or five months kind of a, a heavily reduced rate trying to keep things alive but again we're a very unique type of program in the fact that you know yes we're so fortunate with our olympic funding that's where our funding comes from we get you know unlike england sevens who are reliant on the ngb providing a load of money we get very little support in terms of dollars from our own NGB, it's from USOPC together with our private philanthropy. And it's our private philanthropy of, of the Golden Eagles, which have ensured that, that we have been able to keep the program alive um, and protect the players to, to, to ensure that hopefully we can, we can keep them together um, to, to, to push on for, for Tokyo 2021. And, now that's kind of comes back to that full circle to me about why understanding a private partnership and creating possible franchisees and you know let's be let's be creative here let's be called Amazon USA or let's let's be let's be called Honda Canada you know whatever it takes but with that comes you know you're not selling the family silver a little bit but you are 
relinquishing controls and marketing to lateral. But if that secures a ring fence, financial stability for programs to build effective sevens programs and allows us to, to reposition the, the, the world of sevens um, to build what could be a, an, an unbelievable world circuit uh, and create even more icons and bigger stars in, in, in the game of sevens that people and young, young men and young women will aspire to be, then, you know, we've got that opportunity, um, but we, we need to seize the day. So, Mike, uh, we'll let you go first because I know you coached HP, but, uh, yeah, I had an idea a few months ago when we got rolling. I, I loved – I think it's so cool. You used to coach them, and, uh, and now you guys are going head-to-head on the World Series. So, we'll start with you. How did you first meet HP, and what were your earliest impressions? Um, well, funny enough, the first, first time I – obviously, I've, I've watched HP a lot play rugby league um, where he was box office as a, as a young bloke. And interestingly enough, Wigan came to the Middlesex Sevens. Um, I think it was '95. Uh, an unbelievable team of which Henry was 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 their their standoff, um, and they were unbelievable. And Henry had this insane ability to go off either foot, left or right, um, and he read the game so well. So I always watched him from afar as a player. Um, and when they came that that day and they blew the world apart, you know. You could see he was a special talent. Then I got to, to see him up close and personal when he came to England Sevens um, as he made the transition into Union. And the, the great thing about Henry as a player is he was never content with the current answer. So whatever the play, whatever the move, he was always looking to improve it, change it, make it better, keep that thinking and that creativity working. And sometimes, you know, dependent on on how you interpret that with Henry, it depends whether you saw him as that creative spirit, which is what he was, or oh, is, he, is he trying to upset or change something? You know, Henry's ability to read a game and, and make a decision at the cold face, phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And HP, what was your, your take playing for Friday, I guess early on and then later on? Oh, I'm still gushing there, uh, Robin. Thanks, Mike. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll never say uh... it again. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, I, I, I laughed when I first met Mike. Um, obviously, it was the when I, when I first met Mike, uh, I knew going into that England Sevens um, environment, that camp with Joe Lydon, that uh, you know, I knew I knew about Mike and I knew his playing career with England Sevens. Um, but he had that. Um, to me, it sounded like a London gangster accent. <laughs> all right, mate. All right, mate. And uh, I, I used to just crack up laughing with him. And but yeah, I mean, Mike straight away from day one. I think we, we I think we bonded just over initially uh, Mike's knowledge of, of obviously rugby league because he you know, and, and sport in general. Um, so it's pretty easy to to like Mike because we both had a lot in common in terms of sport. I mean, um, in terms of detail, yeah. I, I mean, you know, being coached under Joe and Mike, and then Mike just on his own. Um, like they, they allowed you to play. We had structures in place. There was a framework. Um, but I think the best thing about sevens uh, is sometimes you you can can go outside of the framework. And um, being under you know a bunch of coaches and um, especially at the time of England sevens, where they allowed some freedom, they let you play, uh, but then always come back to what uh, was pretty much our go-to, which was HP get the ball to your wingers because. You know, at, that, at that time, we had phenomenal guests, you know, Richard Horton, Holly Phillips, uh, Tom Vandell, Dave Strudel, Hugo Monia. You could just reel off all of the best young talent for England, James Simpson, Daniel. And really, yeah, my, my job was pretty easy. Conduit to give the ball to those guys and then pretty much watch, their, watch them uh, fly into the sunset and, and wrap around the post score try and you know, you take the credit for releasing those guys, but those guys didn't need a lot of uh, a lot of space. And um, so, yeah, I think I think I bonded with Mike pretty pretty quickly over uh, him allowing freedom. And you know, as a as a sevens player, you want you want that freedom because there is a lot of space, but always rein it back, always bring it back to what you know with the structure and the framework, um, which is pretty much what I what I do as, as in my coaching regime is to. Pretty much copy the blueprint of what Mike and Joe and all those guys before me uh, uh, sort of laid down. 
And HP, let's go to that halftime chat. Uh, so when I commentate on the Sevens World Series, we often have to apologize for anybody's language, right, in the huddle. And I know when I'm doing a USA game and, and the camera comes into Mike and the team is going to be shouting, there's going to be screaming, um, he's going to blow a gasket. And I'm just hoping he doesn't swear because then I have to apologize straight afterwards, you know. But tell us as a player, what was it like being in some of those huddles? Yeah, I've seen some of those um, those rants. Uh, to be honest, I, he didn't really... I don't really remember the, the, the ranting at us. Um, I, I do remember colourful uh, vocab from Mike. Um, wasn't really uh, sort of targeted at any individual. Um, I, I, re- I used to like, I loved it, you know, because one, he had that funny accent. And that really like just brought me back down to, you know, it filled me back down to the focus. Um, he was pretty, for me, it was pretty simple messaging, which is, you know, he's great. One or two things was always get that player or where we need to improve this um, or you're doing this really well. And you were just, I think the, the, the tone and the, the, the expression of it was probably the fun thing. It made you kind of giggle, you know, around, around all the chaos that's going on and, you come in and Mike would bring you straight back into, uh, you know, laser focus. Um, and then, and then you'd, you'd have a word in your ear, something, something quite, that would be quite, could be quite inane or quite not even around the subject, just to bring you back into the moment about uh, what you've got to do. And we, we had a pretty successful team back then. Um, so we weren't really down in many games where you had to really uh, sort of kick our butts, so to speak, and, and bring us back into the moment. Um, yeah, I've seen them. I've seen them pretty colourful at times. Well, that's yeah, it's fun. It's part, it's part of the, the the passion. The energy is is part of it. It's totally part of it, Mike. Let's go to you quickly for on that because uh, obviously you've been around the series for so long. Uh, give us your your your, your uh, um, insight into coming into the halftime huddle. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Ken. It's very very. It, it is tailored to the to the team and the individual and, and, and to those to those those moments I'll be honest with you it is I think probably in my younger days I was as, as H just said I was probably more colourful because I was coming from a playing into a coaching believe it or not and I know you lot have to apologise nine times out of ten when you leave the USA halftime huddle but it's not me it's Danny Barra he purposely purposely now consciously I leave it and he chucks a couple of F-bombs in just knowing that that's (laughs) going to come out. That's the, that's what I have to live with, with the likes of Danny Barrett now. But I think, you know, as H has has said, for me, I think there's all, I always do something to try and bring them back to the moment to make them focus on what they've got to do next. And then I'll talk about two or three things that I want them to do or or to continue doing, because that's all you can do. And then if I need to pick somebody off individually, that will happen whilst Madison's talking or whilst one of the other boys are talking or, or as I'm walking in or walking out. And you can only make small changes. You've got to have done your work before and after. And then as Henry's just said, you've got to trust them to go out there and, uh, and, and express themselves and give them their freedom. And sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes they get it right. Um, that's unfortunately the beauty and the pain of the game that we, that we play on the World Series. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear that we uh, spoke to Andy Friend and, and his character is a little different, uh, soft-spoken, you know, and so it's really interesting to hear, hear from, from how you guys cope with your players. Uh, let's go back a bit. Touring on the Sevens World Series or touring in general has changed tremendously over the years. Uh, you know, things you could do back then you can't do these days. Uh, Mike, anything on your side that you remember traveling or touring that involved HP uh, or, or, that, or that team? <laughs> We, right. only have an, we only have an hour, okay. So, uh, <laughs> I think, look, I, I've travelled with love, Mike. Yeah, I've, I've travelled with <laughs> HP as a, as a player, I've travelled with HP as a, as a coach, and I've travelled with HP as a veteran uh, when we played vets rugby together as well for the Christina Noble. And I think the, the, the most important thing to, to note about Henry is, right, he's a, he's a proper character. Um, and, you know, Henry is um, a, uh, an individual that is is able to express himself both on the pitch and off the pitch. Henry has a, is a great character socially. Um, he knows how to enjoy himself and he knows how to enjoy himself with everybody else. Um, and I think that's a real positive part of being part of a squad. But the, the big thing about Henry was, as, as a player, is like rain or shine, whatever's gone on, whenever you call him to train, whether it's at nine in the morning or, or whatever, Henry rocks up and he delivers. 
The unfortunate thing was that if we had had, let's just say we'd had a colourful night the night before, which we did, if we think about Barley back after the <laughs> Commonwealth, Commonwealth Games in 2006. And I, I will tell this story because it's brilliant, right? Because Henry can turn up and deliver. But unfortunately, these young players like David Strettle back then <laughs> and, 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 and Matthew Tate and, and those guys, they can't. And there was, and, and I told them, look, you've got to deliver. We've we got to do this. You've got 48 hours to go mental. And believe me, as a group management players, we had an amazing time. But then we had to call it in. And I knew that Henry, well, I know what Henry's capable of doing, both like off the pitch and on it. And, we, and I knew that he'd probably push the boundaries, right? Which is exactly what you expect from Henry because he does it on the pitch as well. And uh, he was at the far end and he had his visor on and he had his sunglasses on. And I was like, I'm going to get you. And literally, I was like, right, we're running shuttles. And literally, we ran shuttles for 45 minutes. And Henry just kept going back, kept going, eyes forward, visors on. You had Tatey on his knees, you had Van Dell, you had all of Strettle just hanging. And Amor, who's the captain, just looked across me and he knew as well. And, and Simon was fit and he was like, it's got to stop because it was hot. But Henry was like, I'm having none of it, mate. You, you ain't going to beat me. <laughs> so in the end, mate, I had to call it in and call it a day. But that's the, the beauty of a character like Source when you're, on, when you're out touring and when you're out is that he's, he is able to galvanise the boys off the pitch. But he's also, most importantly, when it comes to dealing with the business on it, he can do it. And that's the, the part of the journey that young players need to learn and need to be a part of, of, of where understand your body and where your, your boundaries are. And I mean, we've got some great stories. You know, not for this podcast, but we've got some great stories. Henry, I've done a number of podcasts where they talk about your top tourists, who you would bring with you. Canada are so fortunate and they've got both Henry and they've got Kingsley um, because they're in my top three um, every time, all the time when it comes to touring. Well, they fit in well here. That's for sure. <laughs> HP, what do you have for us on your side? Uh, thanks, Mike. That, you, 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 did, you, you put me down, let me down well there. Um, <laughs> you know, I think my, my first uh, memory of playing with England is at Hong Kong, and um, I think one of the one of the lightest stories was um, at the end, at the end of the tournament we played. I, I think that first year, two thousand one, Mike or two thousand two. Yeah, one two thousand one. Two thousand one, and in the rain. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty wet. Uh, we played Fiji in the final, played Serevi, played a, you know a class Fijian team, and I don't think anyone really had see much of England at that time to suggest that we would go on and win that tournament. And obviously that, you know, still to this day it's the tournament to win because of the, the hype around it and the history. Um, and we won that tournament and that night it became a tradition which started for the next few Hong Kongs after that is <laughs> the dress shirt that you wear. Uh, we're at one of the bars, it might have been Joe Bananas or, or, or one of the uh, uh, pubs Don't where it became a tradition to to rip the pocket off your shirt, your dress shirt, because uh, we were celebrating the win, and we're obviously going back to our clubs. And uh, I just remember it was being in a bit of a haze. We're ripping each other's shirts, and basically the shirt would come off then. Um, and I just just reached out for the shirt and ripped this pocket off the shirt, and, and it wasn't one of our guys. It wasn't one of the team. And this, this luckily English guys just looked at me as I've ripped the shirt. He's going, oh, bloody hell, you're Henry Paul. And I'm going, yeah, really, I'll buy you a beer. Like, oh. So he got involved with ripping shirts. And it became a ripper, ripper shirt a thon, and that became a tradition. And it's a lovely tradition when you win. Yeah, just, I just had to be careful on who you, who you pick as the person you're <laughs> ripping shirts. And yeah, we, we had a lot of, yeah. I mean, off the field, I'd say that, you know, to, to create a, you know, some team spirit and, and build camaraderie sometimes, you... You, uh, you know, it's not all about what happens on the field. It's it's built um, at training by all the hard work, and then you know, going, you know, being a good tourist, um, and that, that just makes those those trips away, especially when you're away from your family and, and friends, and and your clubs. Uh, it makes it worthwhile. It makes all the all the hard work, uh, you know, put why, why the reason you play. I think. And how, how have you seen, sorry, how have you seen the series evolve since your playing days to now as a coach in the last 15, 20 years? It's 
way more professional. It's um, there's a lot more uh, put into uh, the teams and to the the coaching side of it. Um, the teams, the coaching uh, staffs are bigger, um, I'd say. Um, but it's still got that intimate feel. It's still got that um, family atmosphere. You know, we I think we all want our obviously we all want our teams to win, and we you know we're quite hard on each other and and our teams, but. There's a nice camaraderie off the field as well, uh, especially some of the guys that we know. Obviously, I know Mike, but even some of the new, you know, coaching uh, staff that you come across. Um, there's a real, you know, family atmosphere there, and, and and you have like the conversations, you know, around rugby, and also not around rugby, which is really nice because you can sometimes come here like just it's just all rugby, 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 uh, but you're sitting in airports for a long time, you're on buses for a long time, so. Uh, that part of it's still the same, which is which is really nice. Now let's touch on your playing career, HB First. Um, you excelled at both rugby union and league sevens and fifteens. What elements of each code did you like? Uh, I like the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, let's be honest. I played professional sport because you know, uh, you know it was I was a high, you know I was a, a, a trainee teacher back in Auckland. Um, before I went to England, uh, signed a four-year deal with Wigan. Um, I'd signed for the Warriors. Uh, they were the Auckland Warriors at that time, and uh, what was the NRL, the ARL at the time. So I was one of uh, probably 20, 30 kids um, from about 15 to 18 that had signed for the Warriors. Um, and I was in that production line um, where I don't think, you know, I learned about professionalism quite early in my career. Um, they sign a bunch of young kids up and then hope that you fight your way through and become a, a top professional. But I was able to leave uh, Auckland because I, I was on that treadmill with them. Um, and I, who, who knew if you get even a shot to play in the uh, NRL? Um, a lot of the guys that I played with, top young uh, players, never never went on and played uh, top-level uh, premiership, uh, top-level rugby because they just got lost in the, in the, in the numbers and um, you know the way that professionalism is. So I, I got away. I got out uh, quite lucky. Worked out a deal between Wigan and, and Auckland, and I got to start pretty much from day one um, at 19 with that with that great Wigan side of uh, you know probably that you know sort of mid uh, 90s to 2000. And uh, yeah, I mean the the good things about rugby league, uh, you know, just the, being able to get the ball in your hand, play. They're really similar to rugby when I, you know, when I switched over to play for Gloucester. Uh, I, I joined a Gloucester team that wanted to um, experiment and play. Um, and, and that, you know, that suited me finally. I had guys around me at Gloucester at that time. Uh, Andy Gomesall just wanted to shift the ball a lot. Um, Terry Funaloa, Samoan, who, you know, he was just like, you know, give me the ball, I'll hit it up and I'll give it back to you. Uh, we had to coax Ludovic Mercia out of kicking it all the time, uh, which meant we basically had to, um, beat him up at training and say pass the ball because the guy had a you know he had a rifle rifle boot cannon boot they could shift at 60 meters so and then we had young young wingers on our wings that you know wanted to see the ball um, James Simpson Daniel Marcel Garvey so when I joined when I joined Gloucester it was a great chance to just play again as well get the ball shift the ball and then you know really play rugby how it should be you know this UA play yeah, that's, that's uh, I mean, such a fascinating career between the two different codes, you know. Um, we're going to come back to you because I have another follow-up question there. But, Mike, let's go to you. What, what are some of your 15s and 7s highlights as a player? Well, no one here, Henry's. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different. Um, I mean, look, my, 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 my career was a little... I, I was at Wasser as a youngster, part of the Colts and the under-21s with the with same team as Delalio, Wally. We all came through at the same time and we were part of the these kind of 19, 20 year olds that won the Middlesex Sevens back in 93. We beat Samoa, who were the Hong Kong champions. We went on to come back and beat Northampton in the final from being 24, five down. So it was, you know, for young kids against a, a, a full, a full bore Northampton team. So then but back then when I was playing, there was only two subs on the bench and you only got on if they were injuries. <laughs> No. So I left to go and get rugby. So I, I moved down a division and went to Blackheath for four or five years, played rugby there and then came back to Wasp in, in 97. Um, and, you know, within that time, I, I kind of had got close to 
England A, we're not really, because I'm the, I was the same age as Dawson and Bracken. And I wasn't as good as them. So the reality was I had to, to, to carve a different niche away from the club game. And, and I wasn't, uh, what you would say, a passing scrum half. I was a running scrum half, which is always a problem. Um, so, you know, I, I found my, my niche and my, my opening in sevens, which kind of suited my, my kind of maverick, the way I played the game. So I, I went with England to uh, the Commonwealth Games in 98, Kuala Lumpur. Um, which was an experience. Um, and then obviously with, with England to the World Cup in 2001 in Argentina, uh, where again, we, we always played with, we had an exceptional group of players on paper, but we never took it seriously. I mean, you know, we always met two days before or the night before and flew and just got on with it. And you were coming up against the New Zealand team that had been in camp for four or five weeks, the same with the Australians and so forth. So we were always good for the that one performance, but never the continuity of, of, of three or four. So I had, a, I had a, what I would say, an average kind of playing career. I had a great times at London Wasps, you know, um, and, and enjoyed playing with some great players. And I had a great time playing with England and playing on the Invitation 7 circuit as well. So I was just fortunate enough to, to bridge the amateur and the professional game. So I got to, to, to make sure I had a balanced outlook on on life um but more importantly was able to experience the early days of professionalism where you are allowed to be yourself whereas i think nowadays that the new age professional they're a, they're a different type of person um and a, and a different character to manage uh, and be which is an interesting evolution over the last kind of 15 20 years within the, the professional game of rugby I love, Mike, how you said you weren't much of a passing scrum half, but when HP joined your team, you're like, just pass the ball. All I want you to get out to the wingers. I do, do as I say, not as I did, right? That's, <laughs> that's one of those great things as a coach. <laughs> like, uh, I, I can't call you the geezer because I don't know, I don't know your nickname, and Hiriyama uh, let out one of my old nicknames that I despise, but uh, I, what's your, where does geezer come from? Uh, it's, a, it's a nickname I got given when I was at Wasps when I was a like a 19 year old and it, and back then there was this uh, song by the shaman called Ebenezer good he's a good he's a good Ebenezer good and I was the only bloke from London Wasp which was northwest London that was from southeast London so my accent's different to all of the other boys in London as Henry has so articulately put and, <laughs> he's a, he's like that's what I see when I first heard him speak it's like oh no like uh, there's a New Zealand thing right what do I know about London and get uh, and <laughs> Get, get gangsters. Mike's a gangster. <laughs> he just obviously went into real estate, but that's a front. <laughs> that's a total front. <laughs> that's his uh, like secret identity in the background. He's just, yeah, mate. He's chopping <laughs> knees. He's taking people out. <laughs> <laughs> now, HP, uh, your journey, of course, fascinating, um, playing league for New Zealand. And then how were you able to transition and, 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 and kind of uh, get into the England setup uh, in, in Union? Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a yeah, fascinating time. Um, I mean, my history, family history, my, my grandfather's English. He was born in Liverpool, brought up in Keswick in Cumbria. Um, you know, I found this all out when I, when I signed for Wigan and moved over. Met my aunties, uh, some some great aunties in Manchester. Um, took them to bingo a couple of times. So I learned about bingo. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, but yeah, like uh, you know, so I, I I was able to travel. I was I was able to sign that deal in England basically because I could get an English passport um, through Ancestry. Um, so I did that. Got my British passport. Some you know dual dual passport holder. And then you know I had, I had like amazing time with New Zealand Rugby League. Loved my loved my career with Rugby League and with Wigan and Bradford, um, London Broncos uh, at the end of my career there. Um, but when rugby went professional, you know we'd had a taste of the, that that crossover game with with um, against Bath uh, Rugby League up in Main Road, the, the ex um, the old Man City um, home ground. Um, and then obviously played uh, Bath at Twickenham, which was you know fascinating. Exciting. Um, then we played the Middlesex Sevens, um, and there was a buzz there. And then I'd always seen, growing up in New Zealand, seen the Hong Kong Sevens, um, seen Sevens, you know, uh, the format. Um, and then just yeah, when it went professional, 
rugby, rugby union went professional, I thought, why not? You know, like, um, I always love a new challenge. And that was presented to me. You know, I'd, I'd done a lot in the game in rugby league, and I just, I just felt I wanted something fresh and new. And, and sat down and talked with a few clubs, and Gloucester just took my eye, um, really took, yeah, took a, a, a real big shine to them. They reminded me a lot of Bradford, um, hardworking, um, you know, close to the community type club. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, relished that, that challenge. And then obviously when I switched over, Clive Woodward knew my ancestry and, you know, asked me, asked me if, you know, if there would be a possibility to that, you know, you, you qualify for England, would you play? Spoke to my folks about it. You know, my dad's a proud Maori. Um, my mum's proud English, um, English woman. So, you know, what, you know, I had no problem, you know, you know switching my allegiance, um, and I'm in a really fortunate place now, you know, whether it's rugby league, rugby union, England versus New Zealand, it's a win-win for me. Uh, I don't see why I can't be proud of both sides of my family, you know. And uh, and so, yeah, I just, when I, whenever I got that chance to play for England, um, I, I, I relished it and was as proud as, you know, playing for New Zealand rugby league, so... We're going to switch beers, sorry, switch beers, switch gears back into coaching here and uh, how you both started. We'll start with the youngster, Henry Paul. So how did you get your, uh, your start in coaching? I suppose like every player that's coming through, um, I did a lot of uh, coaching clinics for certain clubs, whatever club I played for, um, you know, coming from a teaching background initially. Um, I got no, I'm a big kid myself, so I got no problem jumping out in a field of kids and, Starting up a game of whatever, um, whether it's scarecrow tag or you know just touch rugby. So um, I was always uh, asked to go and do clinics at first, and then camps, um, and then that progresses into helping out on, you know a couple of nights a week at, at different clubs because you're mates or, or friends of the family. Um, so I was always going to different trainings, and you know it was a really, it was a good for my rugby career, uh, my rugby. My own, my own rugby self, you know, getting to run around during the day professionally and then in the evenings jump out against some amateur club and, and and get stood up by some amateur player that's working a job as well. I'd be like, well, that's embarrassing. I've got to lift my game, you know. So I did all that you know, as a, during my playing career. And then my, my real start was um, was Steve Diamond, um, who, had, who was a friend of mine and someone I, you know, bumped head was, he was coaching um, Sail Sharks uh, a lot during my career, and you know, we'd, we'd, he'd, he was my uh, England Saxons coach. He was looking for a coach. I was just coming out of my sort of playing career at, at Leeds Carnegie. Um, he wanted, you know, is, is, I was chatting to a team in maybe Japan to, to keep my career keep going, um, hanging on in there, and. Uh, Steve asked me if you know I'd like to spend two weeks in Denver and a week in New York coaching the Russian team um, in their preparation for the Rugby World Cup in 2011. I said, yeah, of course I'd love to. So I went and did that three-week uh, stint with them and we were pretty successful. Uh, took, took the England team pretty close, uh, beat Uruguay. So they asked if I would stay on and coach in the ENC and then coach in the Rugby World Cup. And I thought, well, what, what you know, when am I get the chance to catch in the Rugby World Cup, especially in New Zealand? So I took that chance, and yeah, I, I'd never looked back from um, from playing. I literally retired that summer and took over that yeah that um, that Russian team with 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 Steve, became his attack coach, and then uh, a year and a half into that, after the World Cup, they asked me to be the head coach for the, the Sevens, and they were trying to get on become a core team. Uh, we played a couple of a uh, couple of tournaments on the World Series. Mike, we'll jump over to you. How you got your career started, and then also how you transitioned into business after you finished up with England. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I first kind of got into coaching when I did my ACL, and I was still playing back in kind of ninety seven, ninety eight, and and I needed uh, something else to go alongside the rehab. Um, so I agreed to do my local club, my grassroots club, uh, where, where you know I'd learned as a five-year-old and just to give a bit back, really, um, and enjoyed it, got into it, um, and started and ended up doing my level one and level two. We ended up having a great couple of years, and when I got back fit, I was I just continued doing it whilst I was alongside playing. 
because Wasp back then normally played on a Sunday, not a Saturday. So I was able to, to attend the games and do a bit of that. So that's kind of how I got started in coaching. And then the reality is how I ended up getting my kind of foot, what I'd say my first real break in coaching was probably off the back of the 2001 World Cup Sevens where I was captain. And I'd had such a terrible experience <laughs> with the coach and everything, all the things that, you know, sometimes you learn the most from the people that are a bad experience. And there was an application for the England Sevens coach. And I thought, I was still playing. I'm still at Wasps. So I, I applied. And I got down to the, uh, I was on a final interview and I was in front of Clive, uh, John Spencer, and back then the performance director, Chris Spice. And went well. I then got a call um, three weeks later saying, look, um, we haven't given you the job because you should still be playing. And I still had a year to go on my WASP contract as well. Um, but, you know, we're going to give it to Joe Lydon. Okay, blah, blah, blah. But he, he's going to contact you. And I'd, I'd already said, I'm not playing anymore. I said, I'm done with sevens. And he phoned me two weeks later. And he said, will you, will, you be, will you come in and be my kind of, do my, be my technical assistant? And I said, yeah, I am, but I'm still playing at WASP. I'm just starting my surveying, surveying career again. And he said, right. He said, no, but I said, but okay, fine. And he said, but there's one condition is you've got to play. To which I was like, oh my God. Well, I mean, by then, you know, your fitness starts to do that when you're getting to 30 um, and you're not putting in what you need to be putting in. So those first four or five tournaments, just before Henry arrived as a, as a player, I actually had to play as well some of the time, which was a nightmare because again, you make the mistakes on the pitch that you're asking them not to make. So that's how I got my first break. And I really focused more on the technical side then, um, making sure my detail was right because I'm going to have players on the premiership that knew what they were doing. So you can't bluff them. You've got to know what you're talking about. And then it's about how you can build those effective relationships to get the best out of them. So that's how I ended up in it. Um, and then I kind of took multiple pathways from there on. That's really interesting. And, and just, you know, one thing that, that took me back when I was, uh, I was playing for Canada when you were coaching England is, is when you decided to step out and you obviously focused on your, your business for a while. And uh, I'm just, you know, obviously, you know, running, running uh, the U S men currently and living in England, you must be a, you know, an expert at man management and just seeing, I just want to know some, some background on how your business has helped you be, you know, a, a, a successful coach. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think at the end of the day, whether you're in business or whether you're in sport, obviously people's the business. And being um, very self-aware and having awareness of others and, and, and empathy and being authentic with, with, your, with your people and your players. I mean, look, I think it's not, there's no secret that I stepped away in 2006, just after, I think it's just after Henry went back to, to rugby league. And we'd had such an, a, a fabulous 2006 season. We'd just missed out on winning the World Series. We were silver medal at the Commonwealth Games. And everything we'd done with England had been player-centred. So we were going into those last two legs, going for the title. But the, but the reality was that Henry had to make a decision to go to rugby league. So that was the right decision for Henry. So you've got to go. So, you know, we had five players that could either stand in the last two legs of the sevens or had to go on the Saxons tour. Well, you, the right thing for you is to go on the Saxons tour. So we, we always understood where, where we sat, but, and I was comfortable with that. It wasn't necessarily about winning, it was about player-centered de decisions to allow them to become the best versions of themselves. The real reason why I left England probably back in 2006 is that, like all things, what was going on at board level and the way that players were being compromised on their development for access to other things upset me. And as a, as a coach, I've got to look those players in the eye. And if I can't look them in the eye, then... There's a saying in England, you either piss or get off the pot. And I was like, well, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this. I, I've, had a, I've had a great time, but I'm not compromising my values. So I, I stepped away from England and went back into my property business and, 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 building, and building and being a part of, of, of city life, which I was an investment surveyor in shopping centres, but ultimately they, the way, what they used me for was to build teams within the commercial business, which is around people and understanding personalities and understanding what makes each individual tip to try and get the best out of them. And that's something that I've always tried to do wherever I've gone and whoever I've touched, whoever I've been with, whether that's being blunt, the 
the kit man or the, or the CEO. You know, they're all the same to me. They're people and they, and, and they just deserve to be treated accordingly. So that's probably my underlying point wherever I've gone is I try and be authentic, which means that I don't always get it right. I might upset some people, but it's, it's, it's with genuine interest that, that I will do that. And I'll always try and do the right thing, uh, you know, first and foremost. Yeah, it's always interesting hearing people's backgrounds, how they've merged their <clears throat> outside life into rugby. Um, HP, let's go to you for a second. You mentioned the Russian experience. Um, have you got any interesting stories uh, about your time behind the Iron Curtain? How long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Every day was a story in Russia. Uh, I love them. I love my time there. Um, like I love my time with this England Sevens with Mike and and just just quickly on the, on that. I was probably you know, I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but when I look back now uh, at that at that 2006 series where we were we were cruising it, you know, when I left to go back to rugby league because I. I um, had my time up was up at Gloucester. I was coming out of that, transitioning out of that. My, my you know, five seasons at Gloucester, and I, I signed that deal with London Broncos to go back to rugby league. Um, and you know, you know, Mike's right. You know, my relationship with Mike was great. I, you know, and I, the one thing I regret is not finishing off that that series with them. But also, I had that relationship now with Tony Ray, the coach of London, who really was desperate to get me there to London and, and uh, hopefully inject some energy and some, some spark into those boys at the time. And, uh, you know, I, there's one thing I probably regret because, you know, I, well, we, we only had to go into that last game at Twickenham. I think we just had to make the semi-final. Was it my final? Oh, we just had to make, yeah, I, I thought the boys had it. I thought the boys would have nailed it. And obviously as sevens, you know, it's a great, you know, rugby sport in general. Um, you know, you, you slip up, you, you make one mistake and the game's gone. And, you know, we ended up coming second that year. And we'd, we'd done so much. We'd won Hong Kong, we'd won in Los Angeles, we'd won, you know, we'd been right there. So it's probably the one regret that kind of led Mike, that led that, that team down uh, by going, you know, being a bit selfish, but, you know, I, I had to look after me and my family. I went back to rugby league. So Mike Mike knew that and all the boys knew that. But it's the one regret because, you know, I thought I, knew, I thought they had it, but I didn't obviously realise the amount of other boys that were shooting off to for that Saxon trip as well. So, but yeah, Russia, um, oh man, really, really exciting, really great adventure. Like I said, every day, you know, you, you fly from Manchester or wherever into Moscow, into Shiromitrova or Domodovo airport. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was an adventure. Um, we had really, you know, great, you know, once, cause you know, I'd grown up in New Zealand watching, uh, Americanized TV and the Russians, were only ever a U-boat commander, and there was always firing weapons on the Americans or the English. Um, when actually you're in Russia and you're with the people, man, the best people ever, the most accommodating, the most friendly, give you, you know, give you the shit off your off your back, you know, when you get to know them. Uh, so I love my time there. I love my time with the with the players, with the the management. Um, got nothing but but positives, and some yeah yeah some funny stories like. When we, when we, so one of the best for me was, um, we, we had to name a 50 for the World Cup. And, um, we had a board meeting, uh, to, to lay out. And, and to be honest, to, to pick the, the Russian team, well, I don't want to say it was easy, but, you know, the, the, the depth of, of playing, you know, there's only really six professional, professionalized teams there. So, um, the, the, the good players really stand out quite quickly. So we had, we had our 30. For the World Cup, and we had to obviously add 20 other guys to that list to to present to World Rugby three months before the um, before the tournament. And when we're in a bit of a board meeting there, um, uh, Zorik Masandilov, our manager, uh, he was he was really his name started to read through the names, and he just started laughing. Uh, the board members are there, and Zorik's kind of reading through this list, and as he's going down through name by name, he's just pissing himself laughing and myself and uh, Kinsey are, are looking at Zurich going, you know, well, why, why are you laughing at? Like, it's just our team list. He's going, oh, yes, HP, uh, team list, no problem. But this man here, uh, Alexander Yusinov, he died in the war of World War II. And he, he started to read through these names where one person had lost an arm. They were like 90. 
uh, half the team were dead that they had left. So someone threw, and that was the thing, there, there was a communication era where someone had just put down 50 Rush, ex-Russian rugby names, none of the current squad. And so this, this squad that was going to be presented to World Rugby were from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, none of them were, some of them were dead. Some of them had lost uh, limbs and accident. It was just, it was comical. And it, it was a lot of things. It was probably the language barrier, the communication was at times frustrating, but at other times just, it was hilarious. It was, you had a real stitch up there. I was going to say the fact that you said though, Russian, the, the friendliest people you've met, that's one of the few people to say that, right? Because as outsiders, like even the Sevens World Cup that was in Moscow in 2013, uh, that was, a, I would say, an interesting experience for, for us foreigners kind of traveling in there and seeing the military with their machine guns and stuff like that at the Seven Stadium where they outnumbered the fans. Uh, that was a, a really interesting one, wasn't it? It's, it's a shame because, um, you know, like, like I said, when you get to know when you get to know the people, you know, uh, I, I, can't, I can't even count on them. You know, I, I need a, a dozen people's hands. To, you know, the amount of uh, meals I went to, you know, uh, spreads that were laid on for me, you know, and I was just going around to talk about, you know, some player identification and next minute, there's a, a feast on, you know, just food there is, is amazing, you know, obviously borscht soup and, and uh, but just, you know, everything was laid on all the time. It was like a banquet. Uh, no, you know, like for me personally, I, uh, I love my time there and uh, yeah, got nothing but, but credit to those guys, you know, and it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough place to try and grow a sport like rugby. It's so, you know, the, the size of the country is huge and, there's a lot of people putting their hands in their pockets to try and fly fly the guys around and give us the best chance to put a team together that was, you know, handy. Uh, when you look at Krasnyarsk in Siberia to uh, VVA in Moscow, you know, you're talking about you know, 10, 11 hour flights and at a co- at a big cost. So there was, you know, they tried their best and they're trying their best to you know grow the sport there. Yeah, no, you're spot on. I mean, as you're finding it, Mike, you know, being in North America, distances are an issue there, but Russia is next level, you know. Uh, Mike, let's go back to you. Let's let's uh, fast forward to the current uh, uh, last couple of seasons. So last year, of course, most consistent team for the United States ever. Um, you know, everybody's so proud and that's phenomenal. How do you think or what will take to to get the U.S. back to that now that the Olympics is pushed on to next year? Yeah, I mean, it was it was an interesting one for us. You know, this last season as well, we, we, we came in with... with a lot of injuries this at the start of this season, which we're not finished, and so we've had to grow our depth. So you know, we, everybody was like, "Well, you've you've gone back." Well, we haven't gone back. We've just evolved again. And and the fact of the matter is that the seven circuit is unforgiving, and what we've got to do is grow our depth, not just for today, but also for tomorrow. So what we've seen over the last or well, the first six legs, where at times we were a little bit inconsistent and made some schoolboy errors. But when you looked at who was making those errors, they were young guys finding their way. And they've, you've got to get it wrong to get it right, unfortunately. Um, and especially with, with our athletes and our rugby players whose EQ, rugby EQ ages is, is more immature than the traditional rugby nations. Um, I think with the Olympics being a year later down the line, uh, in theory, we will have everybody back now. Um, and everybody will be fit and ready to compete at the start of whenever the start may be. Um, I think the challenge is for for some of them they're a year older, right? So it's whether they can still hang with those youngsters that now are a year older too, and will be a year wiser and a year more experienced and a year better for all of the constructive, negative, bad experiences they had uh, in these last twelve months. So. You know, I think I'm, I'm hopeful that those, the, the hunger's there for those that have, that have been there for a number of years and the drive to try and kick on and finish a job in Tokyo. But I'm also excited for the enthusiasm and the energy that these less experienced guys who will be hungry to dislodge and see 2021 as an opportunity to get one of those 1 to 12 shirts, which they might not have thought was an opportunity in 2020. So then it's down to whether or not I can manage and, and, and keep that kind of herd of cats, even though they're dogs, all kind of pointing in the, in the right direction. HB, you found some real form in your first year at, uh, at the helm, winning 
bronze medal at the Vancouver Sevens. Do you feel this this incremental year is going to add to the development of your side or the forming of your side and give you another year to to get your feet wet as head coach? Yeah, I think yeah, you know, it was devastating, um, obviously for all athletes, and um, you know, I got a lot of sympathy for you know, for a lot of the sports out there that you know. I suppose they had to push the Olympics because of obviously this pandemic, and you know, I feel really sympathy for some athletes that in other sports, you know, because they may have to retire. They, a lot of athletes were were probably thinking this is their swan song. So I don't know. You know, I think um, hopefully we can keep our squad together. Um, there, there, there'll be some challenges for sure. There's some challenges already. Um, I don't know. You know, we 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 were building nicely. You know. The, I've not been in the job for too long, so uh, players are still learning, um, you know, my processes and you know, protocols, and um, I'm still learning about them. You know, the, the biggest takeaway I ever took away from Mike and, and, and my time with him was how easily he transitioned people in. Whether you're a young kid from from National One coming into our environment for the first time, um, you know, most of the time he used to put those kids with me, and I'd have to mentor. Um, which meant we got up to trouble uh, a lot of times and I'd go against the grain of what the rest of the team were doing and go off on our own and do our own little moves. And um, But uh, I suppose that's one of the things, you know, I try to learn as a, as a, as a I'm not a young coach, you know. <laughs> I wish I could say I was young, but uh, not been on the circuit, especially the sevens for um, a while and with a, with a team like Canada that's got a lot of potential. Um, now maybe having to transition some young guys in potentially. I'd love to keep the squad together. I think that, you know that we do, like I said, we did improve over the, the course of the six uh, competitions. Um, but now we have to reset, start again. So it's going, to, and that's the same for everyone probably. We want to give some some goals and some some dates and plan. But right now, like uh, like everyone in every walk of life, we're kind of all a bit it's a bit unknown. So yeah, first job is to keep the squad together, and then. Um, and then just build on what we've been building in the last nine months. Now, another question is that, uh, you know, obviously being connected to, to the men in Canada, there's a number of guys that have come back from professional contracts. Connor Trainer, Sean Dukes away from, from uh, obviously med school. And then a number of the guys that have been in the program for 10 years or so that are, are hanging on and still performing uh, mentally and physically. You know, they've been, those guys have been, been fighting for this on and off the field for a number of years, but uh, also being for myself being involved in the, the development pathway. I know a lot of these young guys might be pushing. So I know if I was a young man, I'd be chomping at the bit as well, which is obviously, you know, going to raise the competition. Do you see any young guys putting their hand up now with a year extension to the build up in Canada? Yeah, there's a bunch of young guys, but they're, they're my secret. Um, they're my X factor. So I, I'm not, no, there's no one, no one coming through. It's, it's, it's <laughs> We're struggling. Uh, no, there's you know you know the U20 guys. There's some there's some talented guys there. Um, you know I think the future is bright for sevens and fifteens. Um, we want to try and give them some some good pathways. You know this the pandemic doesn't help because we had a U, U20s. Uh, uh, we're you know we're getting ready to go for a big tour and you know things like that. Things like to improve like what Mike said that EQ. You know and um, and, and give them some more ex- rugby experiences where. You know, you're right. You know, you got you got to you got to make the mistakes. Um, you know, one one thing I've always been proud of Mike. Uh, you know, when you have a relationship with someone, and you know, I saw how how well Mike did with Kenya and how well Mike did with USA. I've always been really proud of of him. And I like I know I know that guy. I know you know that guy shouting in the middle of the tunnel or in the middle of the huddle. Yeah, I know that guy. Uh, and then people ask me, why is he so crazy? I said, no, it's passion. That's passion. It's not craziness. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we, we're trying to build that, you know, the, what the guys in this current Canadian team have, have done has created a lot of interest and buzz and energy for these young guys coming through. Um, so I, I hope that all of them stay around and, and battle and keep their bodies right. And while we'll try and do our best to, to help them through that um, so they, they can, you know, because they were, they were gutted and missing out in 2016 in Rio. Um, so they've, they've proved and they've earned the right to go to... Um, you know, Japan. So let's hope that we can get them all through there. Yeah. And I think overall for Canada and the U S to both be going to men and women is huge for the sport in, in North America. And I think 
for, you know, it's valuable for global rugby for the sport to grow in in this market in this region. Uh, I got I got an X Factor uh, question that I didn't run by Dallin here, but uh, I woke up this morning early to see that DTH has uh, has is leaving Glasgow. So um, I'm like, where's he going next? Where's he going next? So I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it. Is there any chance that uh, he's relocating back to my island here and fighting for a spot, or is is that off the record? Uh, what a player! What what a job he did for us in the Ripper Charge. The guys, uh, I got nothing but like Edinburgh. Like he's a w- awesome player, wicked player. I'd love to have DTH as part of this program. Um, same with Tyler Ardron. You know, we you know you you, you target players. Um, you know, because you've just thrown this on me, so. You know, would he, would he fit in this program? For sure. Can the guy play? Outstanding player. Proven it over, consistent over loads of years. And he was awesome for us in that ripper charge in uh, Marseille uh, to, to get into the World Cup. Um, but is that realistic right now? I, I, I don't know. Like, D, if you're listening to this podcast, give me a call. <laughs> we'll, have to go li- we'll have to go live today. Well, we've, we've talked to Andy Friend uh, this week as well as Clark Laidlaw last night about bringing in the big names. Obviously, other teams have tried it. Uh, but, you know, the common message is they got to they gotta be in, in well enough time. That way uh, you're just mi- mixing with the tribe and missing with the culture. So, uh, you know, that's one thing. So, I mean, if this is news to you, then then probably he's, he's sticking with the 15s code. Okay, all right, we're just getting on to our final question for both of you, and we'll start with you, Mike. What's it like coaching on uh, the World Series against one of your former players like HP? Um, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, I love it. I mean, there's... It, for me, it's great because it, it, it's it's the it's the it's the next generation, and you know I'm, I'm not, you know Henry is getting on a bit as well, but you know it is it is the next generation. It's it's great for me to see players that coached under me and the play sorry played for me now branching out and being successful as coaches, and you're you're, you're seeing a lot of, for example, Henry's character, creativity clear in the way that his players are playing for him and the way he goes about his business and you know for me it's 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 a joy because as as Henry's touched upon the world circuit the world series you know when it's Saturday Sunday battle lines are drawn you cross the white line everybody is just wide-eyed and it's all out but when we're in the hotel before afterwards we'll often be sat at the table we'll be having a yarn we'll be talking we're looking out for one another because it is a big family. It's a traveling circus. It's a mad circus. But, you know, everybody genuinely wants everybody to do well. Um, it's just those two days at the weekend where, as it should be, it's all out warfare. It's Coliseum. It's, it's Gladiator. Um, and as I said, I said, Henry's done a fantastic job with picking up the Canadian team and getting them to where they were. I mean, Vancouver, they were outstanding. Like just recently, absolutely outstanding. You could see the confidence. You could see the way they were playing off the edges, which is kind of how Henry would keep the ball alive as a play. You know, he talked about the fact, yeah, I just used to serve the wingers. He didn't just use to serve the wingers. He used to hold the middle of the pits to ensure that the wingers had space. And if people over-pursued, he would see it, it'd be gone, and they'd come back the other way. So that, that ability to transfer what you knew as a player into other players so they can see it too is a skill. Um, and you can see that Henry is educating and allowing those players to grow, not only technically, but there's a placebo thing, which is confidence. And that comes from your coach believing in you, nurturing you, mentoring you, supporting you. And, you know, Henry's doing a fantastic job. Amor did an amazing job with England and look where, where he's moved on to now. Tim Walsh, again, did a lot of stuff with me, with Samurai, years gone by. He's doing phenomenally well with, with Australia. So for me, it's, it's, it's great to see all of these boys out there enjoying it, plying their trade, earning a living and pushing the game forward. Yeah, you must be very proud. I had a chance to coach against the late Rick Sudgett. I was coaching Mexico at, uh, at 2016 Olympic qualifiers, and uh, he coached me with Canada for a number of years. And uh, we had a, we, there's a picture of us hanging out right before the kickoff and, uh, and just having a, a laugh and a hug. So, uh, yeah, he was, he was, you know, I was, I was a kitty cut for seven years, so he was so proud of where I'd come to. And, uh, but then once it was kickoff, it was all business and side bets, but <laughs> how it should be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All business. Uh, HP, how about you? How, how's it feel uh, coaching against your, one of your former uh, mentors and coaches? 
Yeah, you know, it's a challenge, um, and that's you know, I've always I've always relished the challenge. Um, you know, Mike uh, with his team, even with his young young team or or inexperienced with the guys that he's bringing through. You know, um, it, it's been such a pleasure to play against them, and it's you know, pleasure to play against all the all the coaches because everyone. The good thing is everyone's got there's a different style and a different dynamic amongst all the teams. So you, when you analyse and you look at it, it's like man, that that is different to them, and obviously Fiji are different to Samoa and Samoa are different. You know, so you know the challenge with the USA, you know, with you know their big man, their speed. Um, you know, with me and Mike can you know have a wink and a, and a bit of a giggle, but yeah, I love that challenge and and I love seeing them. You know. Um, work on the side like i watch him and rocky i watch all you know you you watch and learn and you, you pick up things and you maybe get rid of a few things that maybe habits that poor habits that you do as a coach that you you want to try and get rid of you you, you look at the experienced guys and you, you know or you used to watch um sir gordon titchens you know how he used his manner mannerisms and stuff so yeah i'm, I'm still you know <laughs> learning on the circuit um and it's great to you know to be able to you know off the field sit back, talk to Mike, sit and have a coffee, um, have a good, little giggle about something that happened or something serious, you know. You know, these teams are doing that. And talk about other teams, uh, little bits of advice, little tidbits, um, because we do so much ourselves. But just hear, you know, hear, hearing a little, a little thing about, oh, that guy steps, man, you always go, and you're like, no, I missed, how did I miss that? That's huge. And little things in this game detail can be huge. So, you know, yeah, I really I relish it. I, you know, I also love obviously coaching against um, Simon Amor, uh, Rodwell, uh, John Brake, the guys at England now, uh, guys I played with against. Um, yeah, um, Santi uh, at Argentina. Uh, again, another nice guy off the field, but, you know, those guys on the field in the game's intense. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's another way of sort of having that, that competition, I can't do it now. I can't run around and dump some guys off and sit and spin, but can maybe devise and work with your team to still get that that, that competition feeling and, and buzz and adrenaline that you used to get on match days when you play. Um, just just to wrap up, uh, on behalf of both Dallin and I, we're we are thrilled to have you both on today, and and uh, just really cool to have some some of your insights, and we'd love to get you back on either individually or together again pre-Olympics and throughout next year and just kind of follow your team's uh, developments and dig down a bit more. Yeah, appreciate it, boys. Thanks. Take Thanks care. Kids. Best wishes. Cheers now. Beautiful ball out the top. Yes, Seppo! Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast and catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there and we'll see you soon. They've taken the lunch money from Sunday.